Churches for Middle East Peace is a group of more than 30 church denominations and organizations around the United States committed to pursuing security, justice, and equality in Palestine, Israel, and the broader Middle East. Our priority is to educate, elevate, and advocate. We meet regularly with the White House, senators, congressional representatives, the State Department, and even heads of state. We offer the opportunity to have people go to Israel-Palestine on one of our multi-narrative trips. It really changes your perspective. Another priority is to elevate local voices from the Middle East. Israeli and Palestinian leaders to speak directly to members of Congress and their staff and the struggles that they face. What we ask from the Christian American to support us, to stand with us. The church is called to be peacemakers. The work that Churches for Middle East Peace is doing in really promoting a deep sense of peace and equality and justice in this land. Engaging in the work of human rights and advocating for justice is a discipleship journey for those of us who choose to follow Jesus. What really drives our work, what inspires us, is the belief that peace is possible, justice can prevail. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. May Elise Cannon, and I'm here from Churches for Middle East Peace for this Easter Tide Meditation. We're meeting on Tuesday mornings between um, Easter and the Resurrection. And with us this morning, I'm very blessed from Jerusalem to have Abuna uh, Ramzi Sadawi. Abuna just means father in Arabic. And so, uh, Father, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for this initiative and for inviting me to share with you. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Before I introduce people a bit more to who you are and your background, I would love to open us up with a reading from a psalm uh, in the spirit of meditation. So okay. this psalm uh, is from Psalm 85, and it's the first nine verses. You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, O God, our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all the generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what the God, the Lord, will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints, but let them not return to folly. Surely his salvation is near, those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Pleased to have you with us, Abuna. Uh, welcome. So let me tell people a bit about you. You are coming to us from Jerusalem, from the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, Abuna Sadawi is a Franciscan priest. He's the general administrator of the custody of the Holy Land in Jerusalem. And in a few minutes, I'll ask uh, Abuna Ramzi to tell us what that means um, in terms of his role and his ministry there. Uh, Abuna Sadawi is Palestinian born and raised in Jerusalem. He has his PhD in dogmatic theology and was formerly a parish priest in Jaffa. So welcome, Ahlan wa Sahlan. We're looking forward to our conversation together this morning. Thank you, thank you. So for those who might not be familiar, um, a Franciscan priest, it goes all the way back to um, St. Francis of Assisi. Tell us the history of the order and what the connection is to the Holy Land. And one of the questions that I had asked is for many people, they might not know what it means that the Franciscans are the custodians of the Holy Land. So would you tell us about that? Yes. The Franciscan presence uh, in the Holy Land goes back to St. Francis himself, 
and uh, to the first friars. They came here to visit the Holy Land uh, already in the beginning of the order with St. Francis himself. Uh, in 1217, the first friars arrived, and in 1219, even St. Francis himself came. And the main reason for their presence and for their wish to be here around in the Holy Land is that their love for Jesus and their love for the gospel. They wanted to see the places where Jesus lived, where Jesus accomplished the mystery of our redemption. And when they came here, and it was a difficult period of the Crusaders and the wars, San Francis got upset of what he saw because it is contradictory to his spirit of peace and love to everybody. So he asked his friars to remain. He himself went back to Italy because he had to go back. But as for the Franciscans, for the friars, they remained here, and they wanted to serve in the places of our redemption, especially Holy Sepulchre, the Synagogue on Mount Zion, Bethlehem, the Nativity, and then slowly, slowly they started searching for all other places. And like this, we have a lot of the shrines, the Christian shrines in the Holy Land. Since the Crusaders were defeated and they left the Holy Land, so the Franciscans was, were the only a Catholic presence for a long period of time until the 19th century. So that's why uh, almost all uh, sanctuaries, all shrines are uh, taken care of by the Franciscans. And that's why our name is custodian of the Holy Land. That is to take care of the Holy Land, to take care of the shrines, the places, and uh, worship God in these places. Not only just be present, but even to, be pre to pray and to make the divine liturgy. Then they started helping even the people around. So these are the living stones. We don't have museums, we have churches built of stones, but we have the church, which is made up of us, the living stones of the church. That's beautiful. The living stones of the Holy Land. And I think it's good for people to know millions of people travel to the Holy Land every year. And many might not even know that the sites are, many of them, um, are being uh, taken care of and stewarded by the Franciscans. And so that's beautiful, the living stones of the land. And so you are the bursar for the custodian. What does that mean to be a bursar? It means that I'm the general administrator that has to take care of all the financial and administration uh, things of our province, of our custody of the Holy Land, which is a huge uh, province, a huge region, custodial or ecclesiastical region that includes practically the whole Middle East. Wow. Uh, and not only the political boundaries that we know uh, in these days. Uh, all the finance, all the administration, taking care of them, taking care of small things for administration, but even big things, and uh, the properties, and to follow up all uh, these uh, things for the for the customer. And you hold many hats in my understanding. So not only do you play this role as the administrator, but I heard that you also are teaching at the Franciscan Seminary in Jerusalem as well. Yes, since I have my PhD in dogmatic theology, I teach our seminarians who are preparing themselves for the priesthood. And our seminary here is an international seminary. That is, we have students from all over the world. We have from South America, we have from Europe, we have from Africa, so we are open for students from all over the world. And how many students did you say that you have? As students, uh, we have uh, 55 students, but in the monastery we are a little bit more, since we are other friars living in the same place. And what is that like right now? I mean, we're in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, and so you have this dozens of people living together. What does life look like for you? Well, uh, luckily, and thanks to God, our monastery is a big one, it's huge, so we have all the facilities to maintain the social distancing and not be uh, very close one to each other. 
uh, we can have even our classes and big halls where the students are present, but at the same time, there is a good distance between each other. And uh, of course, uh, living in the monastery, everyone has his own room, there are, so we are not mixing. They, the doors are closed, nobody can come inside. Usually nobody goes outside. We are invited to remain until the lockdown finishes. So we have a very limited movement outside. But inside, of course, we are, this is our home and we are living in it. Mm -hmm. And you said classes are continuing and you're teaching dogmatic theology. So what, for those who might not know what dogmatic theology is, what, what does that mean? It means the truth of our faith, what we believe, and uh, the doctrine of the church. This is mainly the dogmatic theology. So I'm going to ask a theological question, if I may, Abuna. Uh, we're in the middle. <laughs> Thank you. We're in the middle of this Easter tide season between the resurrection and Pentecost. What is the spiritual significance of this time in the church calendar? This is a very important time. If we need to, to go back to the roots of our faith, we need always to remember that we belong to this period of the death of and resurrection of our Lord. Here in the, in the Holy Land, in, in the whole Middle East, when we greet each other during these days, we don't say hello. We say, Christ is risen, and the answer is, truly he is risen. This is our faith, and this is how even Christians, up to now, greet each other in the whole area of the Middle East. So, this is what really we believe, and it goes back exactly to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a period where Jesus passed with his disciples to teach them, and the gospel says to, it, to us that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. It was after his resurrection. So this is exactly what we need to ask our Lord, during, especially during this period, to open our hearts, to open our minds, to open our senses, especially the spiritual senses, in order to understand the scriptures and live them, and live them in our lives. That's beautiful, to open our hearts and our minds to understand the scriptures. What do you think that means, or, or help us, Abuna, um, you know, in the midst of the coronavirus, when many of us can't worship? I, I mentioned to you that I have this picture of St. George's Cathedral from Jerusalem behind me, just as a reminder of the sacredness of being able to go to worship. But in this moment when so many of us are isolated at home, and we have several people watching now, and then many will watch this video later, as you talk about the significance of this moment of asking God to open our hearts and our minds, how does that look differently in the midst of our current circumstances? And what practical things do you encourage us to do to allow the Holy Spirit to be present in us and to open our hearts and minds? Some people were a little bit upset during at the beginning of the lockdown because uh, they were saying uh, that uh, the devil was happy because churches were closed. But we answered, and everybody is answering that maybe churches are closed, but now we are having a church in every single house, in every single home, in every single family. We went back to the origin of the church as a family. And the families are the first uh, part of the church. So the families now gather together. Okay, they are they cannot go a lot outside. They are locked down. This is a perfect time to stay together, to go back, to pray together, because many of our families they don't know how to pray together. It's time that we have peace and we have silence. So and God speaks in silence. So let us hear the voice of God in our lives. Let us open the gospel. Let us read the gospel together. Let us pray together. Mm -hmm. And this is a very important moment. Of course, we are suffering of the lockdown, but this is another dimension of the lockdown is that finally we are a little bit more together, more time spending together. So let us pray. How many times do we open the gospel and the scriptures? 
sometimes we don't know to answer or to explain it. Now with the internet, we can have a lot of explanations and we can read books. So we can have more time to meditate and understand better. And a lot of priests are working using even the social media in order to reply and to answer for them. So let us use these things. Hmm. That's a good encouragement. I The way you described it made me almost not want the lockdown to end. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of the values um, of the Franciscans is care for the poor and care for those who are in need. So what are some of the needs that you're seeing in the community in Jerusalem, you know, and for Franciscans in the Holy Land, for Christians in the Holy Land, but for all of the people living there? What does that look like right now? Now, uh, this period is uh, very difficult and still we don't know how it's going to finish, especially after the lockdown. Uh, many, many, many of people, not only the Christian community, are without work today. Uh, still, maybe they have some money in their pockets to handle things until the, the end of the lockdown. But after that, we need to go back to our activities. Now, uh, it's difficult not to ask a help for people just only to help but we need to give them work. Like this working, they can earn their lives by their hands, by their own work. This is the dignity of the human being, to work and to earn uh, the life for themselves. So we need to go back to give work, to provide a lot of working places for at least the Christian community and others. A lot of the Christians work in the tourism uh, section because it's uh, one of the biggest ones in the, in the state of Israel. So uh, now all hotels are closed, so they are at home. But hopefully once the lockdown finishes, the pilgrims will start coming back. And like this, all uh, the machine, let us call it like this, the machine of the tourism will come back and hotels and all things concerned or inside the tourism section can start uh, working again like this, our community will go back to work. So one of the things I heard you say, we've been talking about what does it mean to um, to practice spiritual activism, where we're engaging not only in the heart of the gospel, but that we're also living it out. And so one of the actions that we can take in terms of spiritual action, um, as soon as we're able to travel again, is even just to come and visit and to be in solidarity with the church in the Holy Land. Is that one of the things I'm hearing you say? Yes, exactly. Uh, one of the things is, uh, don't leave us alone. Come and visit us. Come and visit the places where Jesus lived, where Jesus accomplished our, our redemption. So this is something that almost every Christian has to make at least once in his life. A few things he has to make one, at least once in his life. The first thing is to read the whole scriptures from the beginning up to the end without missing anything. And one of the things is even to come and visit the Holy Land. I am... Um... Uh, I'm afraid that in some of the verses in Leviticus, I might have skipped over one or two. In the, in the passage of Leviticus, you said we need to read the whole scripture from the beginning to the end. And some of the verses in Leviticus, I thought, got a little slow. <laughs> so I have to go back and reread those. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. We have, as Christians, we have to read the whole Bible from the first page page until the very end, at least once, at least, at least, uh, say once in, uh, in the life, but preferably more. That's a, that's a good goal. That's a good goal for us who maybe have a little bit more time on our hands in terms of reading. So uh, Abuna Ramzi, you grew up in Jerusalem and you are Palestinian um, and then felt called to be a priest. Might I ask, what was that calling yes. like? What led you into the ministry? Well, I grew up in a Catholic family, so we are used to the prayer always, at least on every Sunday. So uh, 
uh, and I had a Catholic education and a Catholic school. But at the end of the school, it was a very big attraction to the priesthood that uh, called me, and I felt myself called to serve God in the religious life, especially from uh, a, from this point of view as a Franciscan and as a priest, uh, especially here in this uh, in this time. Um, we just had a question come in, uh, and in our last few minutes, if people have questions, um, is, we'll ask them uh, of Abuna Sadawi. Uh, so this question says, I'm very concerned about Palestinian prisoners. Are they getting sick? Um, have any of them, especially children, been released? I don't have any data about uh, children being released. I know that there is a, a question about the prisoners, the Palestinian prisoners, uh, but I don't have any idea about the uh, resolutions about it. Mm -hmm. But probably they are safe, hopefully, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the things we've been talking about at Churches for Middle East Peace is that many of the issues that we're working on, advocacy issues on humanitarian assistance and human rights concerns, that those realities and needs are still continuing, even though there's this virus. And so we've been continuing to be active. You know, it looks differently when you can't go to Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., um, but we can do it digitally and we can still call members of Congress and do advocacy in the U.S. context. What encouragement do you have for those in the U.S. about ways that they can respond to the needs of Christians in the Holy Land, but also some of these broader issues of the conflict? Um, what type of encouragement would you offer, Abuna? You, I encourage everybody that works to advocate the for peace always. This is one of the main goals of the Christian is to talk always about peace. We have to remember that one of the the first thing that the risen Lord gave to his disciples was peace. So we have to work always for the peace. So we encourage them, we pray them, and they have to know that those who make peace on earth, they are children of God, and they will be very happy in their lives here and after uh, at the end in heaven. So this is something that is very precious that they have to continue on doing it. Peace for them. So everybody who can construct peace, even by giving a good word, even by giving a simple advice, is a blessed person by God. A, to know a little bit, in order to advance peace and to advocate, we need to know a little bit more and always more and more about the real situation and about the whole truth. We don't have to satisfy ourselves with only simple parts of the truth, but we need to go and know the whole truth and the whole story. So, and like this, we can be objective and work for the benefit of everyone. I think that's one of the things that you encouraged us when you talked about the living stones of the land. You know, might we as Christians around the world and Christians in the United States not just look to the Holy Land as this place, you know, which is so significant in our spiritual history, but that we also can know the people of the land and that we can know the Christians of the land who so often say they feel neglected by Christians around the world in terms of, you know, being in solidarity and meeting with them. So we encourage people to visit the living stones of the land, not only the holy sites that are sacred. Yes. yes. People of the Holy Land are uh, very friendly and uh, they would be very happy to receive everybody here. So come and visit even the living stones and the Christians of the Holy Land. A lot of times the Christians all over the world, they hear only the, uh, the difficulties of the community and uh, especially for the economical aspect that they are suffering and let us donate for the Christians. Now it's better even to, to come and visit these Christians and to see if I donate or if I want to donate, let me go and see where I'm going to give my help and my possibilities of helping even economically 
So let us go and visit the places, and maybe we change our ideas, and we have better ideas, and uh, even not only by uh, by economics, but even by giving advices of how to do things. That's a good encouragement. And so now, as our time has almost come to an end, would you lead us in a prayer and a, a closing benediction? Yes, yes, of course. Anna. I'm going to use a prayer that usually we make it for uh, for people who are in need and for people who are suffering from diseases and from difficulties. So like this, may the Lord may uh, give them courage and force and strength to do and to uh, to live and to win these more, uh, difficult moments. Lino Salah. أيها الإله الأزلي القدير يا عزاء الحزانة وقوة المتعبين لتبلغك تضرعات الصارخين ليك من أعماق كل ديق فينالوا في شدائدهم عون رحمتك الواسعة بالمسيح ربنا آمين. آمين. Now I can give you the blessing that usually our father, the Saint Francis himself. Like a lot to give. It is a biblical one, and uh, from our hearts, from here in Jerusalem, from the place where all was accomplished, we are giving the blessing for everybody all over the world, especially to those who are hearing us and participating. Yubarikum al-Rabu wa yahfadu liyudha al-Rabu bi wajhihi alaykum wa yarhamu. ليرفع الرب وشه نحوكم ويمنحكم السلام بارككم الله القادر على كل شيء الآب والابن والروح القدس آمين آمين Thank you blessings to you